Let's wrap up our overview of the Y86 architecture by talking about control flow operations. Recall when I introduced the jump instruction, I said that it was one of these nine byte instructions and we had an op code. And I said, later, we're gonna come back to the function code. And now is that later time. So the jump instructions still basically take an operation code and then a destination, which is where you wanna to jump to, which really means what value am I going to put into the PC or the program counter. But in addition to what we call unconditional drum jumps, which have function value zero, we have a family of conditional jumps. Those conditional jumps say, if the condition codes in the processor, right, those flags we talked about, overflow, carry, sign, if those are set a particular way, then I want you to jump. If they're not set a particular way, then I don't want you to jump. So the six different conditional jumps we can do are less than or equal to, less than, equal to, not equal to, greater than, or greater than or equal to. And those are represented by the opcodes that we see on the left, and they're encoding in the picture of the, op, the instructions. So the way these instructions work is that they check the value of the condition codes, and if the condition codes meet these requirements, we'll talk about that in just a second, then you take the jump. If they don't meet those conditions, then you just execute the next instruction as you normally would. So in the diagram at the bottom, let's imagine that we're doing an unconditional jump to address 1000. Then we have seven for the opcode, zero for the function, and we encode the address hex 1000 in the eight bytes that follow. So let's look at how we map those condition flags into these jump operations. So let's take the example of jump greater than. This is saying if the last operation that the ALU performed left a positive number, I wanna take the jump. Well, what does it mean to leave a positive number? It means two things. One, the result wasn't zero, so the zero flag should not be set. And second, it should be a positive number, which means the sign flag should also not be set. So both of those must have value zero. If we want greater than or equal to, then we allow the zero flag to be set. It doesn't have to be set, but we allow it to be set, but again, require that the sign flag not be set. So we get that the condition is that the sign flag is not equal to zero. Equal and not equal should be pretty straightforward. If the last operation produced a zero, the zero flag is set. So on equal, we just have to check the zero flag, and on not equal, we also just have to check the zero flag, but we have to check that it's not equal to zero. And finally, less than and equal to or less than are similar to what we did for greater than. If we want something that is less than or equal to zero, then the zero flag is set or the sign flag is set. They can't both be set because a negative number is not a zero. So either one of those set says less than or equal to is true. And unsurprisingly, less than just says the sign bit is set and a zero flag had better not be set because that would be another inconsistency. Here's a code example that is going to exercise many of these different conditional jump instructions. Rather than talking through the code at you, let's go to the next slide and pull up the simulator. It's the simulator. What we're gonna do is we're gonna treat RSI and RDI like parameters, and then we're gonna exercise a bunch of conditional operations. So let's start off by running the first two instructions and initializing RSI and RDI to be FF and one. The first thing we'd like to do is we'd like to say return one or put a one in RAX if RSI is bigger than RDI. So the way we'll do that is we'll initialize RAX, the return register to have one. So we'll assume that the answer is that RSI is bigger. Now we're gonna make a copy of RSI and put it in R10 so that we can keep using RSI as our parameters. So we do that. So now RSI and R10 have the same value. And now in order to do a comparison, I'm gonna do a subtraction. I'm gonna subtract RDI from R10 because if that leaves a positive result in R10, that means that R10 and therefore RSI really was larger. 
So let's do that subtraction. And we see that R10 is now FE. And if we look at the condition codes, nothing is set. So when we do the jump greater than, we say the sign bit's not set, the zero bit's not set. So therefore, we're going to take the jump, and that will put us at line 17 here, and we will not move the zero into RAX. So let's do that. We do that, and we look at RAX, it's still a one. We did the jump greater than, and so the next instruction we execute had better be at line 18. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So we left the one in RAX, and now we reinitialized it to one because we didn't know what was gonna happen above us. Next, we're gonna say, okay, we'll return a one in RAX if they're equal. Now in this case, they're not equal, so it better not happen. So again, we're going to save a copy of RSI into R10. So R10 now has FF again. And once again, we're gonna subtract RDI from it. When we do that, we get FE, what you would expect. But now when we say jump if equal, the zero flag's not set because it, those two values weren't equal. So we expect that the jump is not taken. And sure enough, what we see is that we now moved a zero into RAX, thus returning a zero. Let's do one more check. We're gonna check if RSI is greater than or equal to zero. So initialize RAX to one again. And now this is a little tricky thing. In order to test for zero, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do an AND of R10 with itself. Now, what should that do? That's going to produce exactly whatever was in R10, which is RSI. And if they're equal, I'm sorry, if there are any bits set, then this will be non-zero. But if there are no bits set, then it'll be equal to zero and we'll get the right value. So we're going to do that and in R10, and it's still equal to FE, that is not equal to zero, but it is greater than zero. So when we do the jump greater than or equal to zero, we should take it. And so we shouldn't see that we write a zero in RAX. And sure enough, we jump over it and go right to the halt. The last thing I wanna talk about is the conditional move instruction. You might remember way back at the very beginning of the Y86 videos, I showed you the register to register move. And I said, for right now, we're gonna put zero in the function field, but we'll come back to that. Now is the time to come back to that. In the same way that we can put any of those conditionals for jumps into the function field, we can do the same thing for move register to register, and it turns it into a conditional move. So what does that mean? What it means is that just like the jump instructions only take the jump if the conditions are true, the move instruction is only going to move from one register to the other if the condition is true. So the unconditional move has a function of zero, but for values one through six of function, they map exactly to the same values that the jump instruction did. And so we can use this conditional move the same way that we use the conditional jump in some instances. So if you look at the code snippet on the left is sort of the canonical code that we used when we were experimenting with all those different conditional jumps. We initialized RAX to contain a one saying the default is we're gonna return true. And then we made a copy of RSI into R10. And then we did the subtraction. So we subtracted RDI from our temporary R10. And then we did the conditional jump saying, if the condition holds, then we're gonna bypass moving zero into RAX and returning false. Let's look at the contrasting one using a conditional move. In this case, we initialize RAX to zero and say we're gonna return false by default. We're going to initialize R11, another spare register to one, because that's what we're gonna use for our conditional move. Then once again, we're gonna make a copy of RSI into R10, and then we'll subtract RDI from our temporary. But now, instead of jumping around the condition, we'll say, if the condition holds, take what we put in R11, that one, and put it in RAX. If the condition doesn't hold, RAX will remain unchanged 
and we'll end up returning zero. Let's take a look at that in the simulator. Well, that has essentially the same program I did with the conditional jumps, but this time using conditional moves. So just like before, we'll start off with some values in RSI and RDI. And this time we're also gonna start off by putting a one into R11. Now, when we want to check if RSI is bigger than RDI, by default, we'll assume no, so we'll initialize RAX to zero. We'll make a copy of RSI into R10, just like we did before. And now we're gonna subtract RDI from R10, just like we did before. Now we come to the conditional move. What we're saying is we've already got a zero in RAX. So if the condition does not hold, we're all prepared to return false. What the C move is gonna do is say, if the following condition, which is that R11, that I'm sorry, the condition codes are that we are greater than zero, then take what's in R11, the one, and put it in RAX. So in this case, RSI was bigger than RDI. So when we execute the next instruction, you'll see that we put a one into RAX. Let's look at what happens in the next case. We reinitialize RAX to zero. We make a copy of RSI again. And now we're gonna do the same subtraction. Only this time we're gonna say, if in fact we return to zero in that register, then do the conditional move. Well, we didn't return to zero. So when we execute that instruction, RAX did not change. Finally, the last example, we'll do this AND Q of RSI and RSI, which is going to keep the same value in RSI, but it will give us an opportunity to set the condition codes. So when we execute that instruction and we do the AND, we should see that RSI and RSI does not produce a zero, but it is in fact greater than zero because it's the value of RSI. And so now when we do a conditional move on greater than, we see that the value does change to one. So in some cases, when you, instead of doing a conditional jump, you can do a conditional move. As we start to look at the implementation of the processor, you'll get some insight into why the conditional move might be a more efficient instruction.